All right, cool. So uh, we're happy to have uh, Varun talking to us today about solving high dimensional MFG, MSCs via machine learning. Uh, okay, so uh, just to give you like a overview, this is uh, how it's, this is gonna go. I'm gonna sort of explain what I mean by MFGs and MFCs, but uh, I'm abbreviating uh, mean field games slash mean field control. Uh, so these are uh, very interesting and useful problems. And then we'll see how to possibly solve them. And uh, there's sort of two frameworks that I put in these slides, but we might not get to the second framework. Uh, but here's, here's sort of like the reasoning behind why this might be something that's interesting. So it turns out that if you want to solve a mean field game or mean field control problem, it uh, ends up becoming a like the optimal solution or optimality cr criteria ends up becoming a partial differential equation that you want to solve. So doing it in high dimensions just doesn't make sense because of the cursive dimensionality. So what we're going to be doing instead is trying to use the method of characteristics. Uh, by the way, I'm not an expert on this. I'm going to be finding uh, becoming more of an expert in my PDE class. So if someone already knows PDEs, maybe you can help me through <laughs> with this. But um, we're gonna turn uh, a continuity constraint that we end up getting, and we're gonna write it as uh, an ODE system. And then the original uh, optimization problem that we have with certain constraints becomes unconstrained, and we turn the function that you use to um, sort of, uh, which is the decision variables in the, um, optimization problem that ends up becoming uh, we parameterize it like a neuro, neural network and then we end up solving it. so that's like TLDR and let's, let's go ahead and figure out what what the hell a mean field game is so uh, just the way that I like to think of this is um, so let me like formally tell you and then I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you how I think of it it's a uh, sort of you want to think of a population of rational meaning people that want to do the best possible thing for themselves and indistinguishable meaning the uh, players or agents are symmetric you can sort of swap them out and they'll end up doing the same thing because they want to do the best thing for themselves and they don't have any no one player or agent has more power uh, say or um, can make a huge uh, impact on the overall population so uh, and they're all playing this uh, differential, non-cooperative differential game. And uh, I'll sort of, uh, you'll, you'll sort of like surmise what I mean by this. And this is on, uh, on the interval zero to T. So what we're gonna be doing is uh, we're going to have, consider, let's look at like pick one a agent, let's call him uh, agent I. And we're gonna look at the state of agent I. We're gonna think of it as, a point in d-dimensional space. And it's gonna be uh, sampled uh, from the, some initial population density that we're gonna call row zero. And um, what the actions that are available, available to agent I, I'm gonna call V superscript I. Uh, and they're sort of d-dimensional. And uh, you think of like a little, maybe like a little uh, velocity vector point uh, it's essentially a velocity vector for uh, the states. And what you end up having is, now I'm gonna call the um, states of player i at time t to be uh, given by z superscript i of t. Um, and the dynamics that we have are that the, um, the time derivative is given, uh, is sort of controlled, the velocity is controlled by the agent uh, with initial conditions. So when you sort of look at this all together and you have maybe like a continuum, when you have a continuum of agents, you sort of end up having this uh, sort of empirical measures and we want to uh, take the limit of them with uh, as the number of players or agents goes to infinity. And that's going to become our uh, pop like the population density of states at time t. So um, keep that in mind. So I like to think of this as some type of like fluid or something in d-dimensional space moving through and each particle gets to choose where it goes. So that might be some helpful way to think of this. So 
um, so from now on, let's like get rid of superscript I and just think of like a um, agents in this way that I just described, but like without the I. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some running cost uh, and some interaction cost or some type of regularization term and a terminal cost. And now a sort of representative agent would want, what they would wanna do is they wanna find the V that minimizes this optimization problem. Well, okay, you might say, Varun, this is like this optimization problem. It depends also on this population density, which we might not know, right? So like just for the purposes of up to here so that I can explain where we're coming from, uh, let's assume that we can, uh, that the agents have a forecast of the population density functions. So they know, they know how this changes. And so then what, the, what this problem ends up becoming is there's, there's sort of like an equilibrium strategy or a Nash equilibrium, of, if you will. And v, v hat here is like some other actions that might be uh, available. And what the, each agent wants to do is find, uh, find the V that minimizes this, this functional. So, okay, so because we, we have indistinguishable and rational agents, we can sort of assume that if you uh, flip players around and stuff, they're gonna do the same thing and they're gonna do the best thing. So they will all want to find the equilibrium strategy. So this ends up becoming uh, more or less this other type of problem, which is if you have a Nash equilibrium being satisfied, so you assume that everyone's doing the best possible thing for themselves, then each individual agent starting at X and uh, at time T is going to want to solve this optimal control problem given that rho is uh, the um, population densities are forecasted uh, subject to the dynamics. So think of this as sort of like a potential in every point in time and space, a like a potential energy of some sorts. And um, okay, here's some things that are outside the scope of this talk. But if you're interested in knowing about this, uh, I think if you go on uh, Craig Evans's webpage, he has optimal control theory notes, which sort of uh, spell out where these come from. So um, the first thing is there's, there's sort of two uh, optimality criteria. So we wanna find the solution to this um, value function. I'm gonna call this thing a value function or a potential function. So we want to find the solution of this. And it turns out that it solves this partial differential equation where the Hamiltonian H is given by uh, this expression here. And uh, th so this, this ends up becoming some type of like optimal, uh, gl global optimality criteria that we might have. And it sort of produces this thing called a feedback control policy. And so you're gonna, um, this is probably like the best possible thing that we'll be able to do. In a more local setting, and in this case, I mean local in time perhaps, and starting from certain initial conditions, you end up having this other idea of uh, optimality coming from this thing called the Pontryagin maximum principle. And what you do is you take your original system and you, you add Lagrange multipliers to create this, um, adjoint equation. And what the Pontryagin maximum principle says is that these, uh, the optimal solution of both of these uh, variables together, the adjoint and uh, primal variables, they solve this, uh, this system with the Hamiltonian being maximized. So, and uh, that's interesting. So if you uh, sort of take the derivative uh, and keep track of signs and stuff, you end up, uh, or alternatively, if you think of this from a fluid dynamics point of view, you end up uh, getting this continuity equation, which say, okay, let's assume that everyone's acting optimally. Then the, den the density, um, the, the flow of population densities that I talked about before, it's gonna satisfy this continuity equation. And over here, you can think of this as sort of some flux. If this is some density, this is uh, like, density times velocity flex. Uh, and so this 
if you did any fluid mechanics, this should be um, um, familiar. So uh, this, this means that some mean field gain equilibrium is going to have uh, the population densities that we, that we were talking about before this, uh, that, that are forecasted, it's going to satisfy solving this continuity equation, okay? And so there's another sort of way of solving um, for V and it's using the hamilton jacobi bellman equation and the continuity equation and then sort of uh, peeling off uh, Pontryagin maximum principles to figure out what to do. But this is a very high dimensional PDE setting which requires mesh grids and stuff. So let's try to uh, keep going. I'm gonna give you maybe, I'm gonna, from this setup, we're gonna go and uh, change it a, a slight little bit, but not, nothing really is gonna change. The basic idea is uh, now we're gonna look at our mean field game setup and we're gonna have um, functionals uh, at calligraphic F, calligraphic G, that take a measure and then they spit out a number. And they're gonna have uh, variational derivatives. And if you were like me and didn't remember what they are, what variational derivatives are, um, it's just this definition right here. And um, so once you, once you have these notions set up, uh, these two people, I, I'm probably butchering their names, the last three and Leon's. I, someone told me that it's Leon's last week, so got that one right. Um, they showed that the hamilton jacobi bellman equation that we talked about and, show, and I, I talked about and the continuity equation, they um, end up coinciding and becoming the first order optimality conditions of this new op, um, optimal um, optimization problem. So you have your um, the sort of a type of um, cost functional like we had before, and it's subject to these dynamics now instead. Okay, so these are supposed to be called potential mean field games, and uh, they come from uh, some Nash equilibria ideas of like the 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 Nash equilibria becomes the are going to be the critical points of our potential function, in a sense. So now if we use the Pontryag maximum principle that we said before, and we put it into this, into this functional, uh, we're gonna have um, this expression. And let's add this penalty term. Before I said that the first order optimality conditions are going to uh, essentially um, be the hamilton jacobi bellman and continuity equations. So, Let's just put penalty terms because the first order optimality conditions are supposed to satisfy the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations regardless. So let's put um, this penalty function, which is basically the Ham uh, HAB equations. And this is just going to help us with um, convergence later when we do actual numerical things and I explain what's going on there. So here's something that uh, just, just as like a, a, an aside perhaps is that a mean field uh, control problem ends up being sort of the same as what we've had so far with mean field uh, games, except there's a central planner now that gets to pick the V for every single agent or player. So supposedly um, the only thing that changes is the right-hand side of the hamilton jacobi bellman equations becomes these. Um, and the, the same type of strategy that we're gonna talk about could be potentially used for that. All right, so from now on, we're gonna become a little bit more uh, precise about what we're talking about and concrete, but the same type of idea I give here is gonna be probably useful later on for other types of setups that you might have, okay? So uh, for our, concreteness, I'm going to say that the running cost function, this is going to, and this is going to be used for a dynamical optimal transport formulation or like, uh, uh, you know, um, like experiment later on that I'm going to go over what the paper did. And this is, um, this is how I'm going to choose my running cost, my running cost. And then if you do the math, the Hamiltonian automatically becomes this. Okay. 
And so if I put into using the Pontryagin maximum principle and the fact that my, uh, my dynamics are just V, the controls, you end up getting uh, this as being our, um, our trajectory, in a sense, of, of uh, starting at an initial position. So these trajectories for different agents, they end up becoming uh, what are sort of called the characteristic curves. And um, in a sense, the way I think of them, which might be wrong, I'm gonna learn about this later in my PDE class, is uh, the, the function value, it, it doesn't really, it changes in like maybe a nice way uh, along these curves. So, um, so for our purposes, the solution actually along these curves satisfies this. Um, the continuity equation basically gives us this. So that's nice. And uh, we're going to use this idea quite a couple, uh, quite a few times later on. So in the optimal transport situation, which I'll go over more, the characteristic curves don't really intersect. So they, uh, th this like process of, of um, our trajectories sort of form a diffeomorphism and the Jacobian determinants positive, but um, we want to we want to end up sort of solving this, and that requires knowing the Jacobian determinant, as I said. But doing it at every single time is really expensive, so let's instead compute the log, and maybe that'll be a little bit easier. And it turns out it is, uh, because if you input your um, your initial conditions and you take the derivative in the appropriate way, you end up getting this. So uh, our dynamics are the gradient of our um, of our uh, potential function, and our log determinant ends up becoming the Laplacian. And now let's try to change, uh, do like a change of variables for our um, running cost function. And that's going to be uh, essentially, uh, when you do this change of variables, you end up having, um, essentially you get this. And you can sort of see where that's coming from. You, you do, um, the determinant comes out and you change this into being rho sub zero um, from this expression over here. Okay, so let's take this uh, idea and this is gonna give us, um, let's take like the, a differential version of it perhaps. And this is gonna give us uh, this, um, this differential equation that we are, we're gonna want to solve. And uh, now let's also do the same thing with our accumulated, um, I'm gonna call this transport costs because um, it's going to come, this, this ends up becoming very important in the um, dynamical um, optimal transport problem that we'll talk about later. And then I'm gonna change F to be, I said it was gonna be the interaction or, uh, or regularization cost. Let's call it our accumulated running cost. And we're gonna, once we integrate these two, then we'll get uh, the appropriate things that we want. So applying change of variables gives us the same thing as before. And uh, now let's also do the same thing for the Hamilton, Jacoby, Bellman uh, cost uh, additional penalty terms that we had. So now along a certain trajectory that uh, we described, we're gonna have all of these uh, parameters be, be um, what we want to solve, okay? And so here, here's like our new optimization problem. It ends up becoming, once we integrate this system, uh, it ends up becoming minimize our um, potential function. This is coming again from over here. We sort of took rho out of this equation in a sense. And so now it's just minimize our potential function. Uh, for this unconstrained problem now. And this is once we integrate, we get these. And over here, this you can get by change of variables, which we'll um, see later. Um, so don't worry about this as of right now. Okay, now uh, obviously we can't do this for expectations. We need some certain data points. So let's pick X1 through Xn to be samples from some measure, some probability measure. And these, uh, it could be uniform or um, our, our original uh, initial density, population density that we start off with. And uh, 
this problem then becomes some uh, some form or uh, version of of it, uh, finite sampled version over here, where these are going to be the quadrature weights, which sort of um, weight each term in an appropriate sense. Okay, that's good. Um, let me give you the summaries of what we've done so far. I've taken this optimal uh, infinite dimensional optimal control problem, which is pretty long and looks kind of disgusting. And I've turned it into this unconstrained optimization problem along the um, characteristic curves. Once we integrate these variables, you, you get what you want along the characteristic curves. All right, great. So um, let's try to work and talk about what phi, the potential function might, might uh, should possibly be. Okay. So, um, Here's, here's like the strategy in a sense. For now, let's take S to be the space time variable sort of together. We just like append it to the vector. And we're gonna try to approximate the scalar potential that I talked about before with a neural network model. And essentially here's, here's like the idea. We're gonna have um, uh, our just sort of like weights or uh, tunable parameters to be theta. And this is just gonna be uh, W, theta N, uh, this matrix uh, A, C, and B. And so these are gonna be our trainable weights. And uh, A, C, B, they're all in the appropriate places that we want them to be in the appropriate uh, spaces. But let's sort of look at what this term is. This I'm gonna call my, um, Residual, that ResNet stands for residual neural network. So this is, um, if you don't know, it's pretty, uh, it's a little bit more simple than you think. And this is gonna be one with M layers, so M layers going down, and with weights theta sub N. And theta sub N are just gonna be uh, the matrices and uh, biases here. So what happens is you um, give me your initial point, uh, time space time point and then I multiply by this uh, matrix and it goes into um, this this neural network has width uh, little m so you end up going into m dimensional space and then you sort of just stay there you um, keep propagating this um, this you can some somehow see this as possibly some finite difference formulas so this is maybe a dynamical system. That's one way to think about it. And you propagate this all the way down until you get to UM. And once you do that, you multiply by w, uh, w, and then you get your uh, scalar potential out. So here's something that's kind of important. Um, we wanna solve this system, right? So this requires you to take the gradient and the Laplacian. The gradient is with respect to uh, the space and time variables. The Laplacian is with respect to the space variable. So now what we're gonna do is, let's figure out what the gradient formulation is. It ends up becoming, uh, when you take the gradient, this portion is like pretty simple. And now we just wanna talk about the propagation of, or like see what the actual gradient for the neural network part is. So in the direction of W, the gradient is going to be um, computed by the train rule. And when you do this, you do a back propagation type of, um, you get some back propagation uh, equations. And essentially, oh, uh, I should have mentioned, by the way, I'm sorry if I didn't. These are in the appropriate spaces. Um, and uh, sigma is an element wise activation function. For our purposes, think of it like a, a smooth absolute value function, at least that's what it was in the paper. So, uh, but it could be like a, this thing called a ReLU function, which is this max of zero and the, of a certain real number. So that's um, something to keep in mind. So this, th these, are, these have nonlinear components. Um, all right, just like continuing, looking, uh, going back to what we did. We're gonna look at this uh, and get the chain rule. And once you do this and you keep using the chain rule over and over again, uh, you get these equations. Okay, so once you do this, 
the derivative or the gradient in the direction of w becomes uh, essentially z zero. Okay, that's great. So now let's go into finding the Laplacian. And we're gonna consider here now um, another matrix, which is gonna be E. It's just the first D standard basis vectors in D plus one dimensional space, in our space time space that we're looking at. And uh, our Laplacian ends up becoming this. It's just the trace of, of this thing. So this portion should not be too hard to compute. So um, we're not gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about how to get the trace of um, this when we take the trace with respect to this thing. All right, so um, for the first layer of the, by the way, these are gonna be called layers. Like this is the first layer, second layer, third, so on and so forth. So the first layer ends up becoming uh, just the trace of, of this thing. This is the gradient that we discovered before. And when you do this, you end up getting this. And if you're not familiar with this notation, this like circle with a dot in it, it's called the hammered, uh, or if I'm saying that correctly, the had I don't know. So this is just basically element-wise multiplication of your vectors. So keep that in mind. And for the rest of the layers, you can uh, do the calculations and you get these. And this is just the trace of this, this formula. And the J sub i's are given as um, basically the gradient for the original uh, layer outputs. So um, it's just using the product or a n chain rule and, and stuff. So you end up getting these. When you put this all together, the Laplacian ends up becoming uh, this, this thing. It's just the addition of all of these terms. So this is our trace computation, our back prop calculation, and then the forward prop calculation. All right, uh, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let's continue. So here's, here's sort of like the, the big picture. Let me explain what's going on. So here's how I um, sort of see it. You end up having, if I'm gonna draw a graph, you end up having your, let's say this is, this is time. This is time going till big time t. And this uh, axis, think of it like many different variables. This is gonna be z. So this is gonna be all of these variables here. So this is gonna be z, l, uh, c, l, and c, f, and I think that this is c, one. Right, so all of the, these are here. So you start with certain initial conditions here. Let's say I give you a bunch of sample points, right? This is zero. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna discretize time up into certain, um, into a certain mesh. And now all I do is I, I just sample points from here. So this might be uh, like, like x1, all the way, like let's let's say x n, and you have appropriate initial conditions, like I said before, for all of these variables. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, using this process that I just said, where you're you have the forward propagation, the backward propagation, and then the trace computation. You can sort of have this Euler uh, um, solution in a sense of of this problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the for uh, we're going to take like one time step, calculate the forward uh, um, propagation of this of this like um, of all these variables, and then uh, so this requires a going from here to here requires one uh, forward propagation, one back, and then one uh, trace computation, right? So um, and if you look at the computational time that's uh, needed for each of these, these time steps over here, this ends up becoming the width of the network squared, the um, initial, uh, the, the dimension of, uh, of your 
space time points or your space point variables. And then uh, how deep your network is. And it squares, uh, it, it's, so not squares, it, it sort of scales quadratically with, uh, with. so you kind of want skinny, uh, deep networks. That's a little bit better for our purposes. And so the, the idea here now is like, okay, I use a forward, back, and trace computation here to propagate this. And I keep doing this. And I keep getting, you know, certain uh, values for, for everything. And I do this and I end up getting, uh, at the end, I can compute each of these values at time. Let's just call this big variable like uh, big Y. So I'm going to have at time big T, big Y of T comma um, big Y one say of T. And then you do this for all, for all of these. You, you get some forward propagation of each of these, right? And so this is not covered in the paper that I was reading. So you, so you do this in all of these, but here's, here's kind of the idea. You end up having all of these equations and now you want to take the grade you, and you end up getting some cost um, out of this, some cost function uh, values out. And now you want to take the derivative with respect to all of the parameters or the gradient with respect to all the parameters once you get to time t. And uh, this will, this is sort of like doing gradient descent. So it is kind of a computationally intensive purpose, uh, process. And you end up sort of optimizing or like trying to, um, you end up sort of trying to uh, approximate big fee this way. So you might not get the actual fee, but you're trying to get the value function. And from there, you can calculate everything else. So um, what the, what the people who wrote this paper were talking about and what they ended up using this for as like sort of a, um, a proof of concept was dynamical optimal transport. So you use the same L that I showed you before, but now let's, fit, uh, let's sort of define the other functionals that I said. So if you don't know exactly what optimal transport is, it's essentially the problem is you start off with a measure and then you want to um, find uh, maybe like an optimal pairing of some sorts or some type of flow that takes you from your initial measure to a final one that you already decided. And uh, for our case, the, um, the cost that you, and this, this like flow has to be, by the way, um, it's the, the pairing that you're trying to find or the flow of measures that you're trying to find, it has to minimize uh, the, a certain cost functional. So for our cost functional, it's going to be the norm of the velocity, like I um, said before. Uh, it's, it's, if you go up in the slides, you can see that. And the initial density that we're gonna have is sort of, we're gonna do this in D equals two. And the initial one is going to be um, sort of, spread around zero on the unit circle in a certain way in eight different positions. And uh, the one, the, the final density we want to end at is, uh, has the mean, it's, these are Gaussian random variables, uh, ga multivariate Gaussians, by the way. And um, the final density we want to get to is, has its mean, it's a multivariate Gaussian, and it has a mean at zero, and um, covariance given this way. Okay, so if we uh, take the regularization or interaction cost and make it zero, and then we take this uh, terminal cost functional, and it's gonna be some type of uh, koblec leibler type of functional, uh, like Kale divergence uh, type of thing, and you apply change of variables, you end up getting this. Okay, um, and when you take the variational derivative, you end up uh, getting this supposedly. I didn't check, oh shit, it's all like that. You end up getting this. And so now uh, once the, uh, the authors ran some, some exp experiments and some visualization is given here, you end up basically having the optimal transport plan given to you by these, uh, 
by the like the velocity field of these or the like the flow of measures in a sense uh, from the initial density to the um, and you push it forward to the final one and you end up getting um, sort of something similar as to what you want or have might classically see. So this is good. Um, it seems like I still have time for framework two, if unless people want to ask questions or think I should stop here. Um, I just wanted to ask like, is anyone have a preference? I could go any direction, no? In that case, I will keep going with framework two. Framework two is sort of, it's a similar idea to what we did before, but the idea is a little bit more ad hoc and it looks a little bit more general. Um, and the basic idea is to sort of use two neural networks and they adverse, they like solve the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation and a type of continuity equation together but in an adversarial way so it's to use these things called GANs which are general generative adversarial network okay just give you like basics of, of this this is the idea this is what a GAN is it's um so assume that there's some real distribution that you you want but it's unknown this might be um maybe like for example a distribution of faces this is where deep fakes sort of come from this like idea and so this will be ho hopefully like illuminating <laughs> some level. So there's some initial uh, unknown real distribution that we want to approximate. And we want to sort of approximate it with a family of parameterized other distributions, P theta. And what we do is we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some, uh, our sample space and this thing called a latent space. Assume that the latent space has a fixed uh, probability density uh, or probability distribution, P, Z, okay? And it, uh, there's some like random variable that corresponds with this law. So what we're gonna do, the way that we're gonna make P theta, the, this like class of our family of probability distrib distributions, is we're gonna create a family of functions and, and we're gonna parameterize these family of functions with theta. And they basically uh, take the distribution that in the latent space and they push it forward to the sample space in a desirable way, in a sense. And in this case, the generator uh, is gonna be called uh, basically the output of G theta. So our, the, gen, the generator is basically this, this function, this family of functions. Okay, so in GANs, what happens is you parameterize the generator with a neural network, but you sort of still need some way of like training it in some sense. And so what you do instead is you, uh, or what you do to like help this is you create this thing called a discriminator. And what it does is it takes samples that it might see and spits out it's going to spit out uh, uh it's going to spit out uh values in between zero and one and if it if you're closer to one it's going to think that you're coming from the real distribution and if you're closer to zero it's going to try to say oh you're not coming from the real distribution you're coming from this fake one that that isn't there so hence the name discriminator and so the way that you end up optimizing um, both of these together, it's in, in the form of a minimax game or maxi min uh, optimization for uh, this, this uh, cost function. So if you do um, minimax, you end up, this becomes the upper value of your game if you want to think of it in terms of a two player zero sum game. But if you um, want to do maxi min, it becomes a lower value for your game. So these are sort of bounds of like what, where you're gonna be in, in a sense. And to, to sort of run the calculations and to sort of train this, you end up applying stochastic gradient descent or some type of um, uh, like other optimizer. I think they're called atom optim, like this specific atom optimizer with like momentum and stuff incorporated. This should be alpha sub D by the way, I'm, I'm sorry about this typo, but um, 
you end up, and maybe this should be a minus. I'm not completely sure. But um, you have certain, um, like, certain uh, step sizes, alpha sub D, alpha sub G, and um, you try to, uh, try to optimize or do gradient descent together. So you, you get like some output out from uh, running gradient descent for the discriminator, and then you use that uh, variable for the, the generator and so on and so like you keep switching off. So, and now let's like go back to this uh, mean field game setup that you might hopefully, um, it's a little bit different, but it's still worth going into. Sort of the same thing, but we're going to get rid of the regularization and um, other cost function functionals. They could be all like sort of wrapped in here, um, but we're going to not have a term uh, terminal cost. And the dynamics now end up becoming uh, stochastic. It's an SDE, and your initial distribution it has um, is given to you. And so in this case, as per the notation of the other paper I was reading, um, this think of this as a probability density function. This is just your measure. And they're going to be at 1, and they stay at 1. So again, you have the same uh, um, limit of empirical measures becomes the law, or like your um, measure at time t. And if you, um, if you solve this, you end up, or like the solutions to this, ends up becoming uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation or the stochastic version of it with certain ter extra terms. And um, also this um, sort of stochastic version of continuity equations, which is just, it's called the Fokker-Planck equation. So you get both of these. And uh, the Hamiltonian and the optimal control are the appropriate things that you think they would be. Um, this should be a little b. Sorry about that. Um, and so this is a mean field game setup. So what the the way that this like second paper try or like framework tries to what it tries to do is what we want to do now is we want to choose our latent space to be R D, and the initial distribution that we said is going to be mu sub mu superscript zero, and you have your generator. Is the generator is going to be the value function over over here, and you'll see later on that the discriminator is going to be the um, sort of like mean field information later. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to train the generator using uh, by trying to figure out whether or not it's able to it's whether or not it is the what, yeah, whether or not it's uh, satisfying the HJB equations. And then we get some, using this, we can get some optimal um, control policy out if we want. And then once we, and again, over here, M is given by the discriminator. So then we use that um, optimal control from, that came from the generator. And we uh, try to see if the control now satisfies um, or like the solution that we got above satisfies the Fokker-Planck equation. And we optimize the discriminator this way. And we keep doing this back and forth until we get to a uh, solution and steady state solution. So yeah, um, that's, if you're interested in the um, citations, here are the, both the papers I was talking about. But that is it, I guess. So hopefully that made sense and was helpful. Cool. Uh, thanks, Brian. So if everyone could uh, do whatever they want to uh, applaud in three, two, one. Uh, awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions for Varun? Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I will stop the recording.